Hello and welcome to Musings from the Mountains. I'm Jared Seri, taking over hosting duties this week from Keenan Cummings, managing editor of WestVirginiaSports.com. Um, today, not a lot of West Virginia sports stuff going on. Basketball team is uh, sidelined with some COVID stuff. Football team, obviously season's over, but uh, signing period is getting back into the swing of things. We're gonna answer some questions. Uh, a couple of you guys mentioned on the blue lot, some ideas, some something you, some things you guys wanted to know. We've got a few questions of ours, and so we're going to crack into them. So first question here, uh, we just found out that defensive end Jeffrey Pooler will be coming back to the Mountaineers next season. What does that mean for West Virginia's defensive line heading into next year? A lot. I think truly a lot. Uh, you look at what West Virginia has coming back, you know, up and down the roster. You get back, Don, Dante still has already said he's coming back. You get a key Mesador who probably should have played more than he did last year. And now you add Jeffrey Puller to the mix. That's three. That's your three starters right there. You find a nose in the transfer portal uh, to maybe, maybe I'm not going to say you replace what Darius Stills did, but maybe fill in what he could do. And then you add guys like Jordan Jefferson, you know, Jalen Thornton. You go up and down the list. Taj Austin, if he's back and healthy by then. You have some real depth on the defensive line. You look at what Jeffrey Puller's done. He's a guy that really is a program's guy. He's built himself over the years. Came in as young, a young freshman. I think he was 16, 17 when he enrolled. Um, took some time to develop. And he's he's only gotten better every single year he was here. This was his most productive year this past year. Almost played more snaps than he did the year before in two less games. And was just very productive. Uh, I think he had 23 tackles, three and a half sacks. He's a guy that you can plug in there and he can play different spaces. You know, he can move inside if need be in some pass rushing looks. He's done it before. He can play outside on the edge. He brings you stability. We talk about, you know, stars with, with recruits and commitments all the time. For West Virginia, you know, adding him on top of adding Alonzo Die. Yeah, Alonzo Die back to the mix. You know, those are two six star recruits for West Virginia, just given their experience and what they're going to mean for this team. So we've got a lot of uh, football assistant coaches who their contracts are up after this last season. Do you expect the coaching staff to look any different? Do you expect them to hire a D coordinator? Kind of what, what are you hearing on that front? It's tougher really to, to when you look at this thing, because you had to feel coming into the year that Neil Brown really didn't have a choice, you know, with what he had to do with defensive coordinator. I mean, you weren't going to go out and find a guy given the financial concerns, given the timing of the whole thing. And then you look at what Jordan Leslie and, and Jamila Dye do this year, and do they really need to go anywhere else? I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, you look at, for as much talk as there's been about what Vic Coney did in his first year, those two guys not only built on it, they improved. You know, this was a better defense all the way around. You got to tip your hat to Vic, but still, it's hard to really think about that because you're going to ask those guys to take a demotion in a sense uh, if you bring in a, in a coordinator and They've both already proven that they can handle the role. So I think that gets tricky. Uh, I don't think it's impossible. I think both guys are, uh, you know, humble guys. They'll move around. They'll do what needs to be done. But this is a, this is a, a game of thrones, so to speak, the coaching ladder. You're always trying to move up, always trying to say, make yourself more attractive. And if you go from calling plays to not calling plays, uh, that's not always the best thing. It wouldn't shock me. If West Virginia brings in a coordinator, but I'm, I'm honestly not expecting it. As for other changes, I think you always have to keep your eye out for it. Not necessarily from West Virginia's end. I think they'd like to bring most of these guys back if they can, but that's the college football coaching carousel. It's always spinning. It never stops. And, I mean, who saw Blake Siler leaving for Old Dominion to be their defensive coordinator last year? None of us did. I mean, even with his connections, but th that's how it works. It would not shock me at all if West Virginia has some guys that are attracted to other schools. It's going to be on West Virginia to keep them because they have several guys with expiring contracts. You look at the assistants right now, the majority are uh, have an expiring contract that's up in February. So you start hearing pretty soon about either extensions, you know, new contracts, or possible guys moving on. Uh, something interesting this year, though, I thought just generally is usually the coaching convention. Yeah, that's where you really start to hear stuff. And everything was virtual this year, so it was different. It was more quiet than normal. I don't know if quiet's a good thing or a bad thing, because if you're West Virginia, you like what this staff's done so far. Could it improve in some areas? Sure. But you keep hearing trust the climb, trust the climb. I know some of you are sick of hearing that, but 
you can see things coming together to make that possible. While we're on the topic of this season, this upcoming season, you know, a handful of incoming recruits finally stepped on campus, finally early enrolled, you know, so potentially some guys like Will Crowder, Victor Wickstrom. Um, kind of who, if any of those guys, do you see making a substantial impact this fall? I think that's an interesting question. I think some of that really depends, at least for my sake, on what does spring ball look like? You know, I asked Neil Brown, uh, you were in, you were in there as well in the Zoom conference, what does winter conditioning look like? It's really kind of the same. It's not going to be as, as interrupted this year. We're actually going to go through the motions. And, you know, yes, there'll be more spacing, more practicing, practicing social distancing and those aspects of things. But they're really going to focus on kind of getting things back to normal in a sense. If spring ball's normal, you got to look at some of these guys that West Virginia is bringing in. You know, if a guy like Caden Prather, which I have not confirmed yet, if he's here, I should get that listed in the next day or two. But if he's here, you got to automatically think he has a chance. Uh, impact wide receiver, I think you think he has a chance regardless, just based off his skill set. I think he's a guy that can come in and help. Some of those guys, it's tougher. You know, it's going to be hard for me to say Will Crowder is really going to compete for a job. Maybe he does. I mean, you've seen it before, but you have to feel like some of those other guys are ahead on the totem pole. But you go up and down that list. I think there are some guys that can really help West Virginia. Uh, maybe maybe an Aubrey Burks. I like what he can do is the versatility in, in a secondary. And there's some more guys too. But I think the interesting part about this class is just the quality. I've talked about it a lot. I mean, there's 16 commitments in this class. 17 if you want to count Doug Nestor, who obviously is going to play. He doesn't even count. Um, you don't bring in a guy his caliber and not expect him to play. And he really enrolled too. So. I think the thing that you, you look at this class, I think down the road, three to four years, this is going to be a, a group you point to and say, wow, that, that was a really good group. So what do you see happening for WVU this time around as, uh, you know, football recruiting a signing day heats back up again in February? I think it's going to be interesting. I really do. And the reason I say that is West Virginia has needs, but some of them are immediate needs. And what better way to address that than getting the old transfer portal? I think you do see them look at that a little bit. I don't think that that's the DNA of what Neil Brown wants as a program. I don't think you're ever going to see him take, you know, 13, 15 transfers that you saw with Dana Holgerson at times, you know, from junior college and traditional transfers. I don't think that's going to be in his DNA. But I do think you're going to see him fill spots. You've already seen it with Doug Nestor. I think they have an obvious need at linebacker. I would be absolutely shocked, absolutely shocked, Jared, if you don't see a linebacker transfer, uh, either junior college or, or traditional. I think secondary is pretty safe, too, to pick out. And if they can find the right guy, at wide receiver, and possibly interior defensive line, as I mentioned earlier, you take those. Would it shock me if West Virginia doesn't sign a single guy uh, February 3rd? No, it wouldn't. Because some of this is some of this is supply and demand. I mean, this is a very competitive market right now, and you don't want to take guys just to take guys. Your scholarship restrictions, they can only take five more guys in this class. Yes, they can take from future classes. If they want to take some scholarship from 2022 and meningle that a little bit, they could do that. But it's probably not recommended. I do think the 22 class is going to be smaller overall. But they've got holes to fill. I, I, I think maybe a high school guy, maybe one or two. I think about like you have the last couple of years. West Virginia, I think, has added two guys both times in the late cycle. So think about it like that. A smaller group, if that. And then remember, Sonic Day is not the end of this, guys. There's going to be a ton of guys that go in the portal after spring ball. There's going to be a ton of guys that go in the portal after summer. This thing goes all the way until kickoff. I mean, you saw that with Josh Groudon, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Tony Fields this past year, he didn't even arrive till fall camp after it started. So this thing goes a while, and I, and I think it's – people have to remember that at times. Don't panic. I mean, they have 16 spots. you got to remember, they can only fill 22 of those, and they filled really 17 if you count Doug Ness. So there's still a lot of time, and there's going to be a lot of new names emerge in the coming weeks. Now, speaking of the transfer portal – you know, Tennessee, big news on the block this week. Tennessee is undergoing a regime change. Philip Fulmer, athletic director, is out. Jeremy Pruitt, head coach, is out. Um, a lot of West Virginia fans, you know, they think Darnell Wright, former Huntington High Schooler and uh, on the team over there with the Volunteers, 
a lot of West Virginia fans think that, hey, maybe he's a guy who could hop into the transfer portal. Do you see that happening? And is he a realistic option for WVU if he does choose to go that route? I think if he does, yes. Uh, if he does is the, is, the, is the big question to me. I don't think that it's a slam dunk in any, by any means. I haven't heard that it's a slam dunk. I'd be lying to you if I said I hadn't heard rumblings of things, you know, possibly happening. But you hear stuff like that all the time when it comes to transfers. The one thing about transfers that I think a lot of people don't realize is before the transfer portal was in place, there'd be guys that were set to leave and then would change their mind or set to leave and then change their mind or they were going to stay and then change their mind. There's a lot of waffling when it comes to this. And I think some of it depends with Tennessee how, how things shake out. I think West Virginia, yes, Darnell Wright has not particularly played well at Tennessee, but you take a chance on talent, and he obviously has a lot of talent. Um, you, you aren't that highly recruited if you don't uh, if you don't have talent to begin with. Five-star kid, uh, Neil Brown made a big-time late push on him, just like he did Doug Nestor. It would be highly ironic if West Virginia is able to add both of those guys as transfers a few years after everyone was distraught, they weren't able to get him in the first place. But first things first, he's got to enter his name into the portal. None of it matters unless he does that. And I don't think this is a slam dunk. I think with Doug Nestor, you could pretty much connect what was going to happen there. I think I made it pretty clear on the board without saying so, what was going to happen there. This one, I think if it would happen, there's going to be some challengers. It's not going to be a slam dunk. I do think he probably projects better inside, though, long term. I think he could really have an NFL career there um, inside as opposed to playing on the edge. And we know that uh, West Virginia is bringing in quarterback Will Crowder, obviously, to compete in that room uh, with this recruiting class. But do you see potentially a dual threat quarterback transferring uh, as part of this class or even in the summer? I think Crowder's a dual threat, guys. I mean, I really do. I think some people sleep on his athleticism the same way they do Green. Um, he's very athletic. Uh, Garrett Green is very, very athletic. And I think it goes under the radar sometimes. Uh, he, he's a guy that crushed for 1,000 yards you know, at the high school level. So he can he can move. Uh, he can also throw the ball. He's got, he's got a cannon. So if you're talking about in terms of a true – you know, a guy that more like a Pat White type, I don't know if that's in their DNA. I don't know if they're going to kind of go after those guys. What they really look for in quarterbacks are guys that make decisive, quick decisions, get the ball out of their hands, and can move the pocket, which is really what you have. Does West Virginia bring in the transfer? Honestly, your guess is as good as mine right now. Um, I think they will look at it. I'm actually quite sure they will look at it. Um, I'd be shocked if they didn't, just because you're doing yourself no favor if you don't. You have to look at what's available. Right now, is there a guy that really moves the needle for them? Probably not. Um, could there be a guy? Absolutely. Every year, there's guys that go in late, and every year, and there's a lot of connections in coaching, guys. A lot of these guys were recruited at different places, you know, or recruited to West Virginia and went different places, so. Don't get distraught if one doesn't, you know, there's not one on the enrollment list here in a few days. Uh, I think just like I mentioned earlier with the transfer portal, would it shock me if they took the spring, to see what they have, and they made a decision? No, not at all. And then finally on the football front here, um, what have you been hearing about uh, the recruitment of 2022 defensive tackle C.J. Doggett, who is a legacy, the son of former defensive back Cecil Doggett? Yeah, I think he's he's a guy to really keep an eye on. He likes West Virginia a lot. The family likes West Virginia a lot. There's obvious odds there. Uh, the thing I, I wonder about is the timing. Um, I think that – would it shock me if he's in the – I'm not quite sure. Um, I think that's one that you got to keep an eye on. Um, he's obviously been to campus. He's comfortable with things here. So keep an eye on it, but I'm not quite – ready to say stamp that one in there I think that we'll have to see kind of how that develops over the next couple of months but guess what 2022 recruiting is going to heat up really fast soon and you're going to start to see guys make decisions because as I mentioned earlier these are probably going to be smaller classes across the board nationally due to scholarship numbers we still don't know what the fallout's going to be from this decision to just bring everybody back with an additional year so how's that going to affect scholarship numbers? And if any class is going to be affected, because they were already operating well under numbers to begin with. They were well under 85. So 
we'll see how it all unfolds. But I do think we're going to start to see some action there soon. West Virginia one commitment right now. Um, big time in-state prospect, but they've still got a lot of needs to fill. Shifting over to the hardwood, uh, West Virginia is in Isaac McNeely's top eight. What are the Mountaineers' chances today that they actually land him? See, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen all the doom and gloom that people have over this recruitment, and I really don't get it right now. Um, I think, you know, talking to him, talking to people close to the situation, do I think that West Virginia is the absolutely going to land him? No, I don't think it's a lock at all, but I do think they're in better shape than some people give them credit. Um, I think Virginia's a team that's going to be tough. Uh, North Carolina, Indiana, they're all in the mix. But West Virginia has recruited him as absolutely hard as you can recruit somebody. I mean, they made him a priority. They offered him early. He loves the in-state factor. I mean, he really does. He loves the fact that he could stay on and play. Will that be enough? I don't know. If I had to give it odds, 50-50 is a good thing in recruiting. Uh, it's, about, it's a lot like gambling. If you're hitting 65% recruiting, you're doing really, really good. So I would probably put it at 40. Okay, now obviously the big news of really 2021 so far has been Oscar Shibwe leaving WVU. He's since uh, announced his transfer to the University of Kentucky. Um, but West Virginia has played three games since Oscar left. They've lost two of them. Um, obviously, you know, the team is going through some sort of an identity crisis, trying to figure out what works. In your eyes, what member of the team has impressed you the most? Knowing what I know uh, and, and what Bob Huggins has told us, probably Derek Culver, just because what he's been going through, um, you know, physically, he's been beat up. Uh, you know, Huggins was telling us, uh, he had to get his he had to go to the training room and get his back looked at to even bend over. He's had issues with his knee. And the guy, I think, scored 36 points and grabbed 38 rebounds over the last two games. Um, probably him. I think Tash Sherman's close as well. I really like what you've seen out of Tash Sherman. He's really blossomed you know, since they've gone to that four outlook. He was starting to trend that way anyways, but he's shooting 40% from three, 40% from the field. He'll take that any day of the week. I don't care who you are. Those are great numbers. So one of those two guys, uh, it's tough. You know, I, I'm not there in the training room. We're not a, a, a allowed to be around the facilities right now. But if you take Bob Huggins at his word, which I don't know why you wouldn't, he's always been pretty forthright with us. It's pretty impressive what Derek Culver's been doing it, uh, to be that banged up. Now, obviously, West Virginia has uh, shifted Jalen Bridges into the starting lineup, uh, you know, to play that four position um, through three games. Do you think that he is the answer in the starting lineup? Do you think that maybe try another big in there or maybe just recycle the whole thing completely and try something different? I like what Bridges gives him. Uh, he struggled a little bit, but I think that's expected. I, I think he's, at least from what I've been able to gauge, I think he's a confidence type shooter. Uh, when he's feeling confident, the ball's going in. And when it's not, he struggled. And I think you saw that on the road at Oklahoma. He was really feeling himself, saw the ball go in the basket early, and really was a threat for West Virginia. The last two, it's been marginalized. Some of that's foul trouble. You know, some of that has been his shots not falling. I think his future is very, very bright. He's athletic, do a lot of different things. He reminds me of some of those players that Iowa State's had. Um, kind of sneaky athletic, really. You, you know, you look at him, he's you, know, you don't think that he's going to jump through the roof the way he does, but he, he's very, very impressive, I think. His best basketball is ahead of him. Uh, I don't know if he reaches it this year. But if, if he does for the future while we're out, and experience, I don't think he hurts you in the lineup, I guess is what I'm trying to – I'm arguing the most. He, can he help you? We've seen absolutely yes, he can help you. I don't think he really hurts you. So West Virginia is uh, supposed to come back to the to the basketball court in a couple of days, taking on uh, Kansas State, I believe. Um, what is the biggest thing you'll be watching for when they finally do come back after this lull in the action? Conditioning. We're, we're still not sure how many players were affected. At least I'm not. You might be. I'm not. I, I don't, I'm not even sure how many players, how many people have been affected by this. So. It's conditioning. I think if you're not meeting the thresholds, obviously it means more than one. 
So multiple people had to be affected to cancel three or postpone three games. I don't want to say cancel, postpone three games. So I want to see how their conditioning is, who was affected. And you've even seen this at the professional sports level. Some guys come back and they're really not the same. Uh, you know, they, they look like, you know, they're slowed down. They look like they struggle a little bit. So I'm interested to see, you know, how certain guys are playing, what the rotations look like, and kind of move from there. Because really, as you mentioned earlier, we're still trying to figure out the identity of this basketball team without Oscar Sheepway. And then you throw this on top of it, uh, it's pretty challenging for Huggins and crew. And finally, to wrap things up here, uh, how does Oscar Sheepway leaving affect recruiting in this specific class? You know, there's a lot of people talking about potentially Carlos Curry uh, coming to WVU. Are there scholars? Is there a scholarship available? You know, kind of what are those numbers looking like and kind of how does West Virginia move forward at, at the forward position? This is a long, convoluted answer. I'll try to answer it as simple as possible. Originally, they had two slots they were going to fill for Sherman and Osaboyan. You filled those with two guards uh, from the high school level from Ohio. So you filled those. Then seniors don't count towards the cap. So now you're full, but really kind of two over. So you look, you pull out Sheboy, he's gone. You have one spot to fill. Uh, I think West Virginia will fill that with a big. I think Carlos Curry is who they'd like to get. I mean, obviously, he's a very good player. He's a rim running big. Uh, it complicates things a little further, too, because you don't really know about Isaiah Cottrell. How, how long is Isaiah Cottrell going to be out? Um, that That is a very serious injury. Sometimes it takes a year. Sometimes guys, you know, knock on wood, really struggle to recover from it. So we'll see how that affects him. But West Virginia's got to get big. So, I mean, who knows what happens to Derek Culver at the end of the year. He might decide, you know, it's a career. You know, he's obviously been there four years already. So they got to get some bigs. Carlos Curry is going to be a guy to watch. His recruitment has really taken off, though. The thing that helps there is West Virginia's been on him early. They were on him as soon as he decided to leave Mississippi. Uh, actually tried to get him to transfer into the program. And – he decided to go to junior college. So they've been on him for a while. They've been really paying attention to what he's doing. Uh, Maryland offered recently a few other schools. So it's going to be a bad. He wants to try to visit, which maybe he takes this all the way into April. If if the dead period does end, maybe he he decides sooner. But that, that would be the number one guy to watch. But I think there's going to be others emerge too. This has been another episode of Musings from the Mountains. Thank you for tuning in. As always, for Keenan Cummings, I'm Jared Sari. Don't forget to join the discussion on the blue lot at westvirginiasports.com, and we'll be back soon.